Welcome to the Library Love Fest podcast. I'm Virginia Stanley. I'm Lainey Mays. And Essie Ramirez. We are the library marketing team at HarperCollins Publishers. Join us every week as we present buzzworthy books through author interviews, conversations with editors, and expert opinions from librarians like you. Enjoy the show. Book Buzz, HarperCollins Book Buzz. Check it out. Do 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 do. Book Buzz, HarperCollins Book Buzz. Brought to you by Library Love Fest. Hello, librarians. This is Lainey. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm so excited today because we have a really excellent interview, and I want to welcome our editor who is going to conduct this interview. Um, I have David Highfill, Vice President and Executive Editor at William Morrow. Hi, David. Hi. So good to have you on, and you have a very exciting guest for us. So I'm going to hand it off to you. I do. This is one of those fun occasions that this is work, right? We're talking about books and I'm an editor and I'm here talking to Sarah Penborough, who's an amazing author, but she's also the most delightful person and someone that I wish I lived closer to, but I don't actually. This new book from Sarah is a psychological thriller and it's called Insomnia. And you know Sarah um, perhaps is the author of two earlier novels from us, Cross Her Heart and um, dead to her, um, and also Behind Her Eyes, which was published uh, by another publisher, but is just a very famous, delicious book and TV series at Netflix. So you may have, you may be aware of that. But um, Sarah is so incredibly talented that most anything she's going to say today will be inter interesting. But Sarah, why don't you start with kind of what this novel is about? It's such an intriguing title. Tell us about it. Well, I was first of all going to start with you couldn't live any closer to me because you're in my basement wishing I'd unlock you. But now you said all those nice things, I will. <laughs> so insomnia, really, I mean, it's about a woman called Emma who's approaching her 40th birthday and she starts to she starts not sleeping and she starts to worry that maybe she's going mad like her mother who went who went mad just before her 40th birthday stopped sleeping and then did something terrible. But in a lot of ways, it came out of, you know, I mean, it's not a pandemic novel. There's no reference to COVID or anything like that in it. But what I noticed during that time was women, especially my friends with careers, they were, they were doing everything. They weren't just doing their own job they were doing the kids teaching they were doing and they were not sleeping women I know were not sleeping during the pandemic and I think it heightened to them this thing of women are supposed to be able to have it all but actually it ends up they're carrying it all and so Emma is a woman who's carrying everything her husband stays at home he's lovely but he's a stay-at-home husband and starting to be a little resentful of that in the way that maybe wives often are if they're the stay-at-home wife you know they don't feel appreciated so he's in that situation and she has the career, she's paying the mortgage, she's looking after the, you know, she makes sure the kids have the clothes for school, all that stuff that women do. So she's under a lot of pressure and then she has this, this trauma from her past that is coming back to haunt her. And it's, and it's, so it is a psychological thriller, but I like to feel, and I mean, we all like to feel that it's about more than that. And I kind of think Emma, Emma's my most relatable character I've written and maybe I mean I'm not overly good at likable characters but I think Emma's my most likable character I'm really pleased with the Goodreads stuff that's like oh I really I get Emma I've, I've not been sleeping and I understand this guilt of being a working mother and that men don't have you know women go to I work and right. they, they really panic if they miss a parents evening whereas it seems to be all right for men to miss a parents evening but women are suddenly not mothers if they miss one event because they're paying the mortgage, you know, it's right. kind of. It, it does feel a little bit unequal in the sense that, you know, what I hear from my women friends, at least, who have, you know, big jobs. And so their husbands may be working too, but the sense that even in the most um, happy marriages, that sense of balance between husband and wife and taking care of the kids oh. or between partners and taking care of the kids is 
and, and all those kind of domestic responsibilities, it often feels like, you know, the women are the ones who feel like just it's the share feels unequal. The burden feels unequal. Very much so. I mean, I've got a friend of mine who's called Emma, actually, who I did loosely base the character on. She's very, very high up in a big, I guess, like Home Depot. I think I said to you before, David, like Home Depot here. It's like a big, you know, national store. And she's head of customer service, director of customer services there. And she was young businesswoman of the year. She's really high flyer. And her husband is also a very successful man, but he works from home. But she is the one who's saying, oh, Owen needs the football kit today. It's in this cupboard or it's in that washing machine or... And, and the husband doesn't always get it out on time. And she's constantly thinking about even what the kids are wearing. And I'm like, dude, just, you know, like we're, this is not the 1950s. And she's like, yeah, but if I don't worry about it, it's not going to happen. But it's ingrained, you know? right? It's the kind of thing. It's, that you it's, it's, it's um, conditioned. We're conditioned into it. Right, you know? right. Part of what you said earlier about you feel like, you know, Emma, this character and what she's going through with her family is so relatable. It oh. feels to me like it's the most intimate of your books. So you feel like you're you're sitting beside her, literally holding her hand sometimes as she experiences this trauma and this kind of re reawakening of this trauma from childhood for her, but also, you know, the fears about the people around her and her beginning to second guess everyone and second guess herself. And, and it, this relationship with the boy will who is is he four or five he's pretty young right yeah he's like five six something like that yeah just started right. school they so five i think it shows how much i remember but he's around that age yeah, yeah. right yeah. and stuff begins to happen and she doesn't know if she's sleepwalking or maybe he is mm -hmm. and then she begins to see some things we don't want to give it away but it, it's so intimate this this fear that she has that that will could be in danger in some way and it's and just I think there it's is very subtle I think with, you know, I mean, like, it's nowhere near like having a child, but I have a dog, as you know. And my biggest fear is that I lose him. Not so much that he dies, but that I lose him. And I dream that I lose him and I can't find him. Because obviously through the pandemic, I live alone. He's been my dad. And it's the closest. I know it's not the same as having a child. No, I absolutely understand that. But I don't have children. So for me, it's the closest. And I know for my friends, this idea that something their child go missing is the worst thing that could happen. And I kind of, with Emma, I thought, well, we worry about other people hurting ourselves, uh, hurting our children, but what if we worried about ourselves hurting our children? And Emma has this, is someone else trying to hurt them or, or is it me, is it me? And this, this taking the unreliable narrator to the point of not trusting yourself, I think is core to the book. Very. Because I do think there are times where we convince ourselves of things that are untrue because that's the truth we want to see, not necessarily the truth of the situation. And, you know, you ask a paranoid schizophrenic whether people are out to get them and they absolutely believe people are out to get them, even right. if they're not, because that's the nature of the condition, you know? So I, I, I wanted to really kind of dive deep into that maternal guilt and, and fear. And also this, I mean, I have a complex relationship with my mother and there are many things I admire and respect about her. And there are many things where we just do not get on, whether we're too similar or not. But I, I wanted to play with this fear women have. I mean, it's, I find it really interesting that when we're children, our mothers are the people that are the central core to our safety and, and everything, you know, is about our moms. I, we love our dads. I mean, I was a daddy's girl, but my mom was my safe place as a small child. Sure. And as you get older, if people say, you're like your mother. It's like the biggest insult anyone can ever give you. Yeah, it's a woman. It's like, oh, you're like, and I remember my mom being so anti her own mother, you know, and we have this thing. So I, I really wanted to play with these women's fears of turning 40 in which we're supposed to become invisible. And I speak as someone who turns 50 in four weeks. So invisibility is so yesterday. But, you know, this fear of turning into your mother, this fear of getting older, this fear of being a mother, all these, all these things that, that women have that I don't think men do. I don't know if men do, but it doesn't seem to be talked about in the way that, you know, men don't seem to fear turning into their father in the way that women fear turning into their mother. Or do they, David, do they? I, I don't know. I think they do a little bit sometimes, but, but I think the fear that Emma feels is particularly acute mm. because, because her mother really did 
you know, some stuff that's just so mad. <laughs> it is. Yeah. And and she she's alive in this book and she's an enigma. And mm. so is the relationship that that Emma has and her mother has with the sister Phoebe mm. who's there, who's I mean, so that um that's family a, dynamics are so fascinating, aren't they? Because they're the people we're closest to, and they're often the people we know the least in a lot of ways. You know, my sister, who is very different to me, she's very shy. Um, she's bright. She lives at, with my mum. I mean, she's got a house and everything, but she she lives with my mum. But she really came into her own in the pandemic in ways I did not expect. You know, she looked after all the old women in my mum's street. She got their shopping. She did all the online stuff for them. She was really, and when my dad was dying, I thought she would crumple, but she was really on it. And it was like, it was not a side of my sister that I had seen. I, I always, I'm the youngest and always feel like the oldest, but actually she was very much the oldest sister in that situation. And I kind of think, God, oh, these are people I've known all my life. And yet there are so many layers that I, I don't know. And, and again, with mothers, you know, there are layers you know, in, in Emma and, and her, in the book, Emma and her mother's relationship and, and Phoebe's and her mother's relationship, you know, it's the same mother, but they have obviously different different dynamics because as with any age gap, one, the elder child sees a parent different to the younger child, but they they bring a perspective as a child that as an adult, you look at it differently, don't you? And you kind of go, oh, okay, I see this person slightly differently. So I, I really wanted to play with all of that in it. And I, I hope that it, you know, I hope it works, obviously, but I think it does. I think this idea of you never really lose who you are as a child, but as you grow up, you see things through the prisms of the years. You see people, you know, and it's like when you reach an age where your parents had you and you think, God, they were still children. And then you get past that age and, you know, it's it's scary stuff getting older. God, I'm like, oh, what? It's just, you can see my 50th birthday is looming large over my head. I'm like, oh my God getting so old (laughs) well one of the things that i love about this book is that we have fears for emma but we also have fears about her sanity i mean just back to what we're saying a little bit earlier that you really put us in the position of fearing her and fearing for her and not knowing kind of that becomes this blurred line and i just i think that's so delicious and you do it so well but but back to relationships and children and childhood and stuff tell us about the relationship between emma the heroine and this sister phoebe who's like a whirlwind who comes out of you know she's been in spain or something and had this other life and they've been a little bit distant but yeah phoebe's like really rooted in what happens in this book so tell us about that a little bit well that's I mean, I kind of think Phoebe and Emma are two sides of the same coin and two sides of the same personality almost in that Phoebe has gone off and and to all intents and purposes lived this very sort of, you know, I've gone off and lived in another country. I'm doing all my things. I'm, you know, I'm the free wild one. I've not had kids. And Emma has gone completely the opposite way and she has created a safe space for herself. You know, she's like, I'm going to have, the house and the children and the career and and but both are equally damaged by the trauma of their childhood and they both resent each other for the the aspects of the personality that the other one doesn't have which I I find quite interesting and and you know I mean Phoebe, Phoebe as with Emma you see Phoebe and you you ideally I I don't want a reader to know exactly whether she's good or bad you know, because I, I love the gray areas and I think it's clear in most of my books. You know, I think we all exist in gray areas and we're all capable of doing. Ter- I mean, there are some people who are just born to do terrible things, but most of us are capable of doing terrible things. Without, you know, without planning to, if you know what I mean, or without, I agree. without realizing that that's in us. These emotions become so powerful in real life, don't they? And as a reader, that's the fun of like the, the journey in some of your books that, you know, you realize you're on the precipice of something very bad. Is this woman we're so invested in, Emma, capable of something like this? And anyway, it's just, it's or so is Phoebe Or is, you know, but I do think the key aspect of it is, is, is um, introspective, if you know what I mean. It's about Emma and Emma trying to figure out, it's about trusting ourselves, maybe, I think. And maybe as you get older, 
you know, there are downsides as a woman to getting older. When you're, as you get older, you're much more, in some ways as a woman, you're so much more confident and you're so much more secure in so much of what you think of yourself. You know, like now, if I go into a relationship, I'm not going to pretend to like classical music like I did once. And that was a long three years. <laughs> you know? But now you kind of like, this is what I like, this is what I don't like. But on the downside, for a woman anyway, you feel less physically attractive. You feel, you know, there's all these other things coming to play because I think for women, especially, you know, we have the menopause. We have these things that hit you to, to remind you of your age. Whereas men kind of just, you know, they just get older. I'm sure we they have age things. too. We we do. I know, do. I know, but you don't have this massive, you know, like life change in the but you could have children up to being 70. You know, women have we have these very definitive markers of time. You are now a woman, you are now not not a woman to all intents and purposes, you know. So um, so it's a real balance of feeling much more secure in who you are, but also more insecure in other ways. And so I think 40 is the turning point for that, which is where Emma comes in and she's like, mm, I've got the career. Is this the, you know, is everything else working? And then she starts to go slightly bonkers. Well, here's, this leads me to something else too, which is you've had such an interesting career. You've written more than one kind of book. You've been very adventuresome. And you've also worked in and around TV, kind of working on the development of your, your books for, um for streaming and tv um tell us a little bit about that and what that experience has been like that has been good for you but you also feel like you know it's not been so great i mean be be honest with us what 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 of it have you really liked and how has it affected the way you write today i like the collaborative nature of it because with books and this took me a long time to learn with tv like With a book, you go away, you pitch your idea, someone lovely like you, David, buys it, and then, you know, you go away to write it. And if I'm having a problem with my book, that's when I embrace the world of a bottle of wine, cry a lot, you know, (laughs) et cetera, and then I find a way around it. I would never think to pick up the phone to you or to Natasha in England and say, I've got a problem, or even my agent, I just wouldn't think it. Whereas in TV, you know, if you hit a wall, you ring up and go, how about such and such? And, you know, and you kind of have a group meeting and you discuss the problem and you get to the bottom of it. So the, I really like that. I, d- I always say writing a script is like an affair and writing a book is like a marriage. Because when you write like a marriage, uh, like a book, you know, you're in for a long haul. You're there nine months, 10 months, you, you know, you, it's, you know, it's, it's, little pleasures not not a massive rush you know whereas with a script once you go to script you can write that first draft and you normally do within a couple of weeks of an episode and it's totally all consuming you know if I'm writing a book I sit down in the morning I might do a thousand words and then I plan a bit more and I might do another thousand words but it's a bit like when I'm writing a script you're in it you say you're only going to work on it in the afternoons but you're in it the whole way but then the editing goes on the drafts go, you know, it's endless drafts, endless, endless drafts. More people come on board. And it's a bit like an affair in that it's very easy to get into and you love it while you're doing it. And then it takes you about a year to get out of it and deal with the after effects. Um, but what I do like is it has taught me, my dialogue I think is better. And now when I'm writing a scene in a book, like insomnia is much pacier, I think, than prior books because, I'm a bit like, actually, is this the start or should I start? Like, I remember I sent you 20,000 words. And and then when I said you got the final book, you were like, whoa, this is quite different. Because I think it's just, you look at every scene and think, what's it doing? What's it, is it doing anything? If it's not doing anything, it can go. Or, you know, and I, I, you know, I'm like all writers, you can get a bit caught up in description and waffle. And it's made that a lot better. You know, I'm much more clear in my, storylining I think um but I like doing both but when I'm feeling a bit I always think oh it'd be nice to just then sit quietly and write a book (laughs) so I think I'm a natural like my soul is with with novels but I do I do really like the screenwriting but with insomnia it's quite interesting because when you ask me questions about it because we're working on the tv adaptation obviously we change things and I have to think hang on wait 
wait, wait, before I answer this question, I have to think, do they do that in the book or is that in the TV? Because the two in my head get sort of interwoven. I can imagine. Yeah. I can imagine. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in, in writing Insomnia, because I read some er that early material and then was like reading something mm -hmm. later that was was rather different. I mean, still the same story arc, still, yeah. in, still in her predicament, but yet you dug so deep and kind of getting the kernel of what the 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 essential fear is for her you 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 did you were more aggressive and sort of revising and cutting and, and starting mm. the story slightly differently and it I, i'm so impressed when writers can do that that sort of deeper work because some of them some writers can't do it doesn't mean they're not great but they yeah. they really can't they can't throw away and kind of reimagine even though it's the I same story I think there's always fear as well. Like, I think maybe if I had had a string of like New York Times bestsellers or whatever, I probably wouldn't be as incisive, you know? But I think when you're a bit more like, okay, I've got to get this as, as honed as I can, or I've got to make this as punchy or, and I know, I, I, I know my own, I don't like to use the word failings, but you know, I know my own problems in like I'm always slow in the first hundred pages because I seed a lot of things. You know, I'm trying to see, I want everything to tie up really neatly. So for me, it's like, how can I make those first hundred pace here? You know, like when I go in, because I know that I'm gonna get edit notes that say cut 20 pages from this first hundred pages. So I might as well try and do it now. You know, so with insomnia, I was like, okay, if I was if I was giving me notes what would I say? I'd say, stop trying to be literary and just crack on with the story. And I would say, that's what I did. And so it, it did change the way I, I approached the whole thing. And I think, I do think TV and film are very good at, at that because when you get notes from producers, it's very character centric and very, um, because they're only looking at 50 pages, not 350 pages. It's much more what what is what is really the point of this? What does this character really want? And what are the problems? And so you have to view it very surgically, you know, which I try and now apply, not always successfully, but I try and apply it at least to the edit of a book, you know, if not. If you not were really. you were and you have been just so incredibly successful for me in that in that sort of revision for all of your books, but especially for, mm. for insomnia. Um, it was such a hard, I, I mean, like, I literally loathed, the, loathed this book every every inch of the way. And it, it strikes me that everybody is really liking this book. And so maybe I need to loathe my books more. You've not told me that. I, you know, I think because I had this foolish idea to write the TV and the book at the same time. And then I put the TV to one side. So me and Left Bank had a conversation. We put it to one side. We've got back to the book. So I feel like I've been telling the story for a long time in many incarnations before I got to this one. And I think I found it, I think I, I was being too swayed by, and this is in no way denigrating any other books, but traditional psychological thrillers, if you know what I mean. Like I was reading really good psychological thriller writers and thinking, oh, this isn't quite fitting that remit and panicking. And actually I don't write traditional psychological thrillers. so. You know, I just thought, well, this is the story. I'm going to write it. And if, if I get fired, I get fired. <laughs> but I didn't get fired. So. <laughs> well, I, I love that when you say that, actually, that that this is um, a psychological thriller, but yet it feels different. It feels yours. It feels definitely something that, that you own and that, you, you know, you created. And it's a thriller with a little bit of weird in it. I, yeah. I love the way you say that. It's just a little bit of weird. Yeah. yeah, I like a little bit of weird. I think I love the idea that there is this, you know, a whole other craziness that lurks under our, you know, I think it's like with all of us, it's like, I, I hate ghost story books or horror books. It's always been a, a bugbear of mine and because I love horror. And when I would watch a horror film or read a horror book and someone would see a ghost and they would just accept that they'd seen a ghost and they'd be like, oh, I've seen a ghost. Oh my God, why are we being haunted? Oh my God, this isn't it. And I think no, if I saw a ghost, the first thing I think is that I was going mad. I'd had a brain tumor. Someone had spiked my drink. There'd be this whole psychological, you know, a bit like that quiet panic you have when you find a lump or something and you live in this bubble of your own head for ages until the doctor tells you you live to fight another day or whatever. 
you know and so for me I like that this subspace and 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 it happens a lot in people set up proper ghost stories and proper ghost story environments and I quite like to put those things in normal world environments for me that's re really interesting you know like to put you know even like with dead to her which wasn't as weird as insomnia but there's a little bit of weird and just this idea that under the normal world there is this kind of other other stuff happening well you do it so well and the touch is to make it credible that's that's mm. every novelist's you know task and you you really do that so so well so we're we're out of time sarah but this is just so fun to talk to you you know i adore you i adore this book you're just you're such a delightful person and okay you can come out of the cellar it's fine <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you thank you so so this is insomnia and we're talking to sarah penborough and we are on sale on april 12th 2022 thank you so much sarah and thank you and and thank you librarians and laney thank you and laney yes thank you for listening to the library love fest podcast for more information on this week's episode go to librarylovefest.com enjoying the show we would love to hear what you think Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Library Love Fest and on Instagram at Harper Library. Be sure to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and share the show with a friend. Lastly, if you enjoy our show, we bet you'll enjoy all of the other podcasts from HarperCollins Publishers. Find a list of shows at harpercollins.com forward slash podcast. See you next week.